protecting our liberty. Good evening and welcome to Your Right to Know by the Fitchburg Republican City Committee. My name is Mary Lotz and I will be your co-host for this evening's show. Sharing co-hosting duties with me tonight are my friends and fellow Fitchburg Republican City Committee members, John Strang and Kathy Gogan. Tonight, our very special guest is a native of Fitchburg. He is not a registered Republican, and I always want to make that clear when we introduce people so that everyone knows we have friends outside the Republican Party. And our, our special guest is Peter the Tech Guy in Jemmy. And Peter is um, not only someone who walks the walk but talks the talk of conservatism as we get into the topic of this evening's show, which is selling conservatism. Why I say Peter not only walks the walk and talks the talk is because Peter is a very devout and, and uh, uh, Roman Catholic. You talk about that on your radio show, your syndicated national radio show, and also in your blogs, uh, your international blog. In addition to that, you make your living selling conservatism, conservatism. And I think that's not only admirable, but something that is, is very, very well respected. Um, Peter, right now, I'd like for you to just take a minute and, and introduce yourself, talk about the hat, talk about the Doctor Who scarf, and let us know how you got involved in this. Well, it's actually a funny story, and thank you very much, Mary. I was, I'm called the tech guy, and my radio show is the tech guy on the radio. I'm syndicated on the Money Matters radio network. That's WBNW 1120 out of Concord, 970 WESO, which is out of Southbridge, WPLM out of Plymouth, and on FPR radio nationally. And I'm called the tech guy because my major in college was computer science. I went to Fitchburg State. I graduated back in 85 with a computer science major, went to Raytheon from there, and I was a tech guy. That's what I did. Well, back just after the election of President Obama, the company I worked for was called Highwired. They folded, and I said, all right, well, I've got some time to kill. I'm looking for another job, and who knew I would not find a tech job with years of experience and a good, good record as a worker. I decided I would write a little bit about what I liked more than just, I did some writing for the company uh, about technology and a little bit about internet free speech because you know that was part of, part of the internet at the time. But I started to write about the things I was interested in, politics and religion. And the writing became the reporting, became the radio show, became the syndicated radio show a lot. Of, and it's almost a comedy of errors that got me there. As for the hat and the scarf, I bought the hat started wearing hats in the year 2000. I was teaching a person, I was between jobs, I was teaching an elderly lady computers, bought myself a new suit down at Shaq's, and they had a beautiful gray fedora, and I just had to have it. I've never, I always wanted a hat, so I'm Sicilian uh, descent, had to have it, bought it. When I went to the lady to take her to dinner to celebrate the end of the lessons, she was so impressed because in her day, a gentleman always wore a hat. And so that was it. I started buying hats, and the hats became a trademark. In fact, that gray fedora that I mentioned is now in Florida. I have a series of hats scattered across the country that I loan to various activists when I see them at national events, and then, then I get the hats back and give them to different activists. So my hats have, that's why it says, have fedora will travel. My hats have actually been more places than I have. That gray hat's been inside Sarah Palin's house, and I haven't been. Well, that's <laughs> pretty impressive. As for the Doctor Who scarf, I'm a huge Doctor Who fan, have been forever. And I was doing a broadcast from Concord, New Hampshire at the State House. There was a rally there. And as I'm doing the live broadcast, some of my fans know I'm a Doctor Who fan. They had ordered this from England and gave it to me. And it's reached the point now where if I'm covering an event and I don't have one of my hats and I don't have my scarf, people ask where they were. So even when I was covering the Demolas uh, events back mm -hmm. in July, it was 90 degrees and people <laughs> were protesting out in Andover, I was there with my suit, my hat, and my scarf. I was dying. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to have them there because people now expect them. 
So let's get on to the show and in our, our topic of selling conservatism, our, our Your Right to Know panel, with the help of Professor Strang, way back when we first started, we decided we would make some definitions. We would put out some definitions. So our working definitions of conservatism, and just bear with me and let me read you what, how we have worked to define conservatism, because then we're going to move to you. Conservatism, a conservative derives their ideology directly from the U.S. Constitution, believing that our rights do not come from man or a king, but directly from God. We define social conservatism, one who leans towards a religious basis for decision and policy making. A social conservative would be one who supports a pro-life agenda, prayer in school, maintains the institution of marriage between one man and one woman. And finally, neoconservatism emphasizes the development or influencing of international foreign policy that promotes the expansion of idea of spreading American democracy abroad. So that's our working definition. Now, I'd like you to take it away and tell us what your definition of conservatism is so that when you work at selling conservatism, what are you selling us? Well, I think conservatism as a blanket statement is the common, are the common sense values that our founders and that come from natural law direct a person's life because, and they're all based in reality. Conservatism is a very reality-based philosophy. It's based on what is real, what is actual, what is practical, what has actually worked. And it's dependent to some degree on the people who came before us because the people who came before us all have experience. They, my father didn't get past eighth grade, but he was a very bright and experienced man. And I, I will never be, I have a college degree, I will never be as smart as my father. But my father would say the same about his father, and his father the same. It's a respect for the wisdom that has come before us, rather than liberalism, which rejects the wisdom, all the collective wisdom, frankly, that's come from the classic days. It's as if, when you look at liberalism, it's as if all of the people who all lived before them we're just idiots compared to them. They know best, and it's a very narcissistic philosophy. Conservatism is not a narcissistic philosophy. It builds on the wisdom of the ages, and that's really the selling point of conservatism to me. It's the, common, it's the wisdom of the ages that built the country and built our founding fathers and built our own fathers and grandparents, and that wisdom is what conservatism is built on. Sean, would you like uh, to step sure, in? I guess then I could follow up there. Uh, question is, when did our politics begin to diver diverge from those traditions, especially embodied in the Constitution? Uh, it seems to us that it's especially pronounced now in the Obama administration, where so many in the Obama administration, beginning with Obama himself, seem to show contempt for the Constitution. Even though he had the reputation of being a teacher mm -hmm. of the Constitution, he seems to be uh, more renowned for deviating from the Constitution and obeying it. Uh, do you, where would you place the, the beginnings of these of, of this well, deviation from the Constitution? Well, and there from was our always principles? some deviation because there's always a politician who would use the constitutional process for their own purposes. I mean, remember FDR trying to pack the Supreme Court right. because he didn't get something that he wanted. But right. I think the mm. real breaking point was the ruling about prayer in schools. Now, whether or not you believe that the Constitution separates church from state, which it does, has, says nothing about that. That's a letter from Thomas Jefferson. Strangely enough, other Jefferson letters do not get the same respect, or Adam's letters get the same respect. But you had a single culture. You may have had individuals who deviated from that culture or who went to their own drummer. And that's fine. It's, you have to ha you have a bell curve in terms of how things are in life. And people can go on one end of the bell curve and the other, but there was always a shared culture and a shared mm -hmm. set of values and rules. Now, when those shared values and rules were all known, when the Supreme Court made their ruling in 1962, nobody said, oh, it's not going to make any difference. And at that time, it didn't make an immediate difference because all of the parents, all of the teachers, and all of the children to that point 
knew that set of rules. Mm -hmm. But then a generation passed, and the teachers, those teachers retired, the teachers who became the new teachers were the students who had been taught up to a point. And then you had a new set of students who were not being taught this unless they came from a religious or traditionalist mm -hmm. household. Then a second generation came, and then you had no teachers and no students who were taught these things. And you can trace the difference. I graduated from Fitchburg High in 1981. We didn't need a police officer in the school at the time. Things that are considered normal and necessary now were not normal and necessary in 1980, or even or 1960 even more. Of course, I went to a Catholic school, and the nuns were the nuns. You listened to mm. the nuns. <laughs> but but uh, the bottom line was, that once you deviated from those rules and once you became afraid of enforcing the rules, once it became a question of you cannot enforce these rules, who are you to tell me this child, who are you to tell a child that something is right and something is wrong, that's when it broke down. You'll remember teenage suicide was practically unheard of 40 years ago and now it's common. In the old days we hear about, a lot about bullying, bullying, bullying. If someone bullied you, you were told by your parents, stand up, fight for yourself. But now if you fought, it's a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, our parents spanked us when we were younger. Now, were our parents and grandparents a bunch of barbarians? Those greatest, were the greatest generation who said the Lord's Prayer in school, who spanked their children, who expected their children to obey, and who expected their teachers, expected the students to obey. They were the greatest generation. We call them the greatest generation. Were they all barbarians? Was Jackie Robinson a barbarian? Was Booker T. Washington a barbarian? It's nonsense. And the imbecility of that argument by the left becomes plain once you ask those questions. Mm -hmm. But nobody wants to ask those questions. Kathy, I'm going to ask you to um, ask Peter a well, question. I'm going to ask you a question. Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> In light of the breakdown of society and the way liberals and the liberal media has kind of skewed things, how do we begin to sell conservatism to people again? Well, actually, it's not a hard thing to sell because you look at the examples. You look at the examples of what people did. I mean, take a look. There was a great piece that I saw recently in terms of a, uh, there was a test that was given to students in 1890, and you look at that test, and kids couldn't pass it today because oh. they didn't know about yeah. these things. Now, were students who didn't have access to the internet, who didn't have all kinds of federal money spent, were all these students, you know, were they, how were they so much brighter? Because they applied the rules. And you say society is broken down. I think society has adjusted. We actually now have two cultures in this country. We have the traditional American <coughs> culture, which you'll see in uh, Catholic schools and private schools and homeschooling, which has become very big. And you have the secular culture, which is a very afraid culture. So how do we bring them, how do we mesh them together again? You don't, you can't mesh them. You can only give the example of what works. And hope you they can, see, hope you, they you see can the give lights. the example, but you also have to make the argument. The way liberalism wins is due to fear. People afraid to speak their mind, afraid to offend, afraid of someone calling them a name. Can you imagine the greatest generation being afraid of someone calling them a name? I mean, it's an amazing thing. And people are willing to give in to it. Now, naturally, we're from Massachusetts. We were Red Sox fans until 2003. We couldn't win a World Series to save our life. So we were very fatalistic and maybe gave in more. <laughs> but, but you cannot just give in. Totalitarianism and intimidation only works if you let yourself be intimidated. And the best way to advance these things is to not be intimidated, to not be afraid, to make your case. So how do we, how do we get the youth who's been indoctrinated all these years, how do we get them back into, or introduce them to, into the conservative movement? Well, there's very many- They're not gonna get it at home or no, in their they're school. Not. Well, there so. are simple ways to do it. For example, you, uh, this week there was the Johnny Appleseed Fair. Mm -hmm. You gave away a basket mm -hmm. for the Tea Party. The Tea Party had a setup at the Johnny Appleseed Festival, and you were visible. We've been hearing from Harry Reid and all the people like him that, oh, the Tea Party, they're anarchists, they're bomb throwers, they're, they're like terrorists. And of course, that's not true because if they were like terrorists, the president would be talking to them <laughs> like what they're talking to now. Yeah. But people, you were there and people saw you 
and they couldn't find the horns. Uh, the Twin City Tea Party, for example, they have a meeting every last uh, Monday of the month. It's open to the public. People are allowed to film. So you have people go there, you have people film, you let yourself be open to them. And you do things like Amelia Hamilton, you gave away one of her books, it's a child's book. Mm -hmm. You put that book out there, you give it in kindergartens. Rush Limbaugh has a new book about history that for children, he, you put it out there. There's people like myself, my own blog at thetechiblog.com, I put myself out there, I put those opinions out there and challenge them. And uh, in fact, there's an article I had up today that answered that very question. We were talking about people going to Texas and the lieutenant governor there is worried about Texas someday turning blue. And I said, well, you gotta remember, you have to remind the people that there's a reason why you left Massachusetts. There's a reason why you left Illinois. There's a reason why you left New York. You left those states because liberalism isn't working. So if you bring liberalism to the state you're fleeing to and you do the same thing, you're just throwing rocks in your well. Uh, okay, what about uh, turning the focus now to uh, internecine questions, talking about Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, now there are different stripes of Republicans. Uh, how can you bring together, how do you suggest we can bring together Republicans who are philosophically divergent? Uh, there are people well, who call themselves moderate. Uh, New England Republicans, right. for example, would not be considered as conservative, generally speaking, as those from, say, Kansas. Except for me, of course. Well, uh, <laughs> there are exceptions, you know, but in general, I mean, we produced a Scott Brown, for example, and Scott Brown was not considered but, particularly conservative. But that's, that in itself is a great example. Take a look at the two Scott Brown races. The first Scott Brown race, he emphasized, I'm nobody's man but yours. I'm going to repeal Obamacare. He did not attack the Tea Party. He did not attack conservatism. He talked about his positive message. And many Tea Party people and many conservatives rallied around him. And I've seen Scott Brown when he was in uh, Washington. And Brown, whenever, even people who disagreed with him on the left and the right, when they would show up at his office, Brown would be there, he would talk to them, he would hear them out, he would take pictures with them. He was very polite and very good with them. But the second election, he spent a lot of time running away from his own party and attacking his own party. And that's not how you sell a message. D you know, buy my Chevy because it's not as bad as the other Chevy. Right. <laughs> my, buy my donuts because they're not as bad as the last batch we baked. That's not how you sell something. You, when, a, when a reporter says to you, well, uh, do you want to reject this Tea Party extremist? Well, I don't think the Tea Party's extreme. I want their vote just the same as I want your vote. You're a reporter, you lean liberal, I want your vote because my ideas are better for the country. That's the way you sell that. For example, when Chris Christie runs, and he's gonna run for president, we all know he's gonna run for president, he is, if he's smart, he will emphasize that type of message. I mean, there's already conservatives who are upset about him, but you don't emphasize, you do not build by subtracting, and you subtract by chasing people away. Peter, one of the, the things that, as you're talking, because we look at the opposite of conservative is a liberal, mm -hmm. and yet one of the things that I continue to find is to be a liberal is very easy. Well, of course. Government takes care of you, and you expect government to take care of you. There's little, very little self-discipline or self-reliance expected. Liberal. So again, how do you start turning around generations of people who have expected the government to come in and do everything for them, provide for them in sickness and health and in every other way? Well, I must Again, say it's just not easy. I mean, I, I just, I, I think selling, selling it has to be more basic and come from a much deeper root level. Well, it's a vi there's very basic things. I mean, Barack Obama has done a great job selling conservatism by his policies of failure. I mean, talk to a college student. I mean, my own son, and I hate, I hate to bring this up with my own son, but my own son just graduated with a mm -hmm. business degree, magna cum laude. Hasn't been able to find a job mm -hmm. despite mm -hmm. you know great grades Sounds in, familiar, Cat in yeah. Catholic school, great grades at Pittsburgh State. Hasn't been able to find a job. I was interviewing a young lady because I needed a salesperson for the website, and I asked her, you know, you're se when you're selling, there's a lot of rejection involved in the radio and sales and internet sales. And she said, I know all about rejection. I graduated in 2010. Mm -hmm. You say, did this work for you? Do you have a job? Do you have this college debt? Has it given you anything? Has this gender study major that you paid $50,000 in debt <coughs> to get, 
is it going to feed you? Is it, I wrote a very, um, a piece a few months ago called The uh, Redemption of Andrea X. And Andrea X uh, is a gender studies major who was having a clash with somebody over uh, something that was said. I can't remember the details at the moment, but she was lamenting the fact that she has, she can't find a job. She's going for her master's mm -hmm. and she can't find a, a job. She's got 50,000 in debt. She says, I'm never gonna be able to find a man. I'm never gonna be able to have children because of these things. Now think about this. This is a person deep in liberalism. Right. I mean, gender studies, peace studies, queer studies, all of these things she was studying, but she wanted but a she's family. She's looking for a man. She <laughs> wanted a family and she, wa she wanted a house and she wanted a kid, which are the basic things Men and women really have not changed in thousands of years. Only our technology has changed. The things we actually want haven't changed. We want someone to share our life with. We want a place to live. We want our children to be happy and secure. We want all of these things. And these things didn't, that we have in America did not happen by accident. And you point that out. The thing about conservatism is you can't stop teaching. It's like having a son. I have two sons. And you have to remind, I have to remind my sons, you know, you've got to get out the trash, you've got to do this. I mean, anyone who has sons and daughters knows this. You have to remind them constantly. This is the nature of conservatism and anything. You have to keep teaching. You don't stop teaching because people forget. People easily are easily distracted and easily forget. Peter, believe it or not, we're coming to the end of our show already. Boy, that was fast. And, <laughs> and I'm going to ask you to talk about your show and your radio, and to um, give us some insight where we can find you. Well, you can find me all over the net, the internet. My blog, the main place where I am every single day is the techguyblog.com. That's D-A-T-E-C-H-G-U-Y blog.com. I write there every day, seven days a week there's writing there. I have a weekly column called Under the Fedora, which is at several key sites on the net, not on my own site. I do write that for other people. My radio show is the Tech Guy on the Radio. As I said, I'm on WBNW, that's AM 1120 out of Concord, WPLM, which is AM 1390 out of Plymouth, WESO, which is 970 out of Southbridge. The Concord signal is probably the best one for Fitchford, but you can also listen via TuneIn Tune in. or Tune via in. FTR radio. And I make my living from individual readers. I ask my readers, you know, I need 15 of you every week to kick in $20, and that's what pays my mortgage, mm -hmm. and I have a readership nationally and internationally. Last year, about a half a million people visited the website 730-something thousand times. Mm -hmm. there was a, there's an awful lot of people. We have one more question from Kathy. I didn't even mention that the show is noon to 2 on Saturdays. So that's the time. It is, that's the and time it's to replayed. Listen. It's replayed 11 p.m., Saturday night and 10 a.m. Sunday morning, but the live show is noon to two. You can call in toll-free 888-9-FEDORA. Kathy, I'm gonna ask you to ask Peter right. one last question. I wanted to make sure we gave him some time before we All finished. Right. Look into your crystal ball, Peter. Who do you think has the best chance of winning the election in 2016? Do the you nomination think or the election? The election. Is Hillary a shoe-in or is she going to get a run for her money? Hillary should not be a shoe-in because she's the only person I've ever met whose qualifications for being president is failing at every other position <laughs> she's ever had. But sh the Democrats have fallen in love with the idea of Hillary. There are some people but, working but behind Peter, the scenes. she's a woman. You have to vote for her. She'll be the first woman. I did not realize that breasts were a primary <laughs> qualification for the presidency, because if that was the case, then we should have voted for Sarah Palin in 2008, which I thoroughly agree with, by the way. On the Republican side, I have to give the edge to Chris Christie, not because he's my favorite candidate, but because he is the most liberal candidate, and there will be several strong conservatives. And the thing that's happened to the Republicans is you will have three or four strong conservatives. You're going to have Ted Cruz, perhaps. You're going to have Rand Paul, who has co done very well for himself. You're going to probably have Bobby Jindal. You may have Rick Santorum. And then you're going to have Chris Christie. So Christie will get 30% of the vote, or maybe more, because Christie is a rather dynamic person. And when it comes to economic conservatism, he sells it very well. And that's one of the advantages that Christie has is he's not afraid to sell conservatism mm -hmm. when he's actually selling it. 
But so he's not he's not perceived as being well he's an advocate of social conservative he's not uh, perceived as being an advocate but he's also rather sly uh christie is not well, christie is, is able lost, to christie to is lost able to social conservatives christie is able to sell and this is the argument i've had with other people myself during the last election i was mitt romney was not even my fifth choice but I was pleading to people, remember, this election is not Mitt Romney versus Ronald Reagan, it's Mitt Romney versus Barack Obama. What we mm -hmm. as conservatives in general, and Republicans in particular for the rest of you, is when we finally have an election, if we have Chris Christie versus Hillary Clinton, we have to look at that and say, Chris Christie's not running against Ronald Reagan, he's running against Hillary Clinton. But at the same time, in the primaries, there are a lot of good candidates, and I am not positive who I'm going to support yet because there's too many candidates I like. Mm -hmm. But all of them would be superior to Hillary Clinton. But watch out for Joe Biden on the Democratic side and watch out for Andrew Cuomo because he's been making some inroads on purpose. And a lot of the anti-Hillary stuff you'll see is going to come not from Republicans but from Democrats trying to stop her. Watch out for that. Wasn't it Glenn Beck who always said they put someone out here and it's always th this that's going on? I think that they're putting out that Hillary's going to be a presidential candidate. I think as soon as we get a Supreme Court position opening up, Barack Obama's going to put her in there. Well, well just remember, conventional Shop wisdom forever. is right, right up until, until the time it's not anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, remember that, and you'll never be afraid to, to act, and you'll never be surprised. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Peter. I mean, what you've shared with us is, is good. Now we've got to get out there and sell conservatism, right? Easy mm -hmm. sell. Well, let's hope it. We're going to call you on it. Thank you, Peter, again. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, John. And I want to thank all of our viewers for watching Your Right to Know and uh, being involved with the Fitchburg Republican City Committee. As we leave you tonight, we want you to remember that your local city or town Republican Committee is really your grassroots level organization that supports and holds dear your liberty, your constitutional values, and your conservative values. We encourage you to join your Fitchburg Republican City Committee even if you are unenrolled. Because why? Because we always stand for freedom. Thank you very much and we'll see you next month. America, we stand in power and mind that reflects our values and preserves our rights and goes forth in power